Hello and welcome to another TLDR Explains video. Um, you might have noticed Thailand cropping up in the news more and more lately with growing protests in the country against the monarchy and their extravagant king. In this video we're going to explain how Thailand got there, what's going on and what it could all mean for Thailand. If you like our videos and you want to see more content like this then be sure to subscribe to the channel. Also there's links to our other channels, we've now got like TLDR US, TLDR EU and Daily Briefing, all of which I would obviously recommend, um, in the description if you feel like it. So, as always with these videos, we're going to have to start with a bit of context, and I'm warning you in advance, quite a lot of context, because it's sort of necessary for understanding the current protests. From about the mid-13th century, Thailand was an absolute monarchy, with an uncodified constitution. In 1932, after what's now known as the Bloodless Coup, the Thai king was forced into accepting Thailand's first codified constitution. Since then, Thailand has basically been involved in this constant power struggle between pro-democracy citizens, the military, and the royalty, usually with the military and royalty in some sort of coalition. In this time, Thai people have suffered through 12 coups and an astonishing 20 constitutions. The most significant of these constitutions, which is now known as the People's Constitution, was the first to be written by elected representatives, it included explicit guarantees about human rights, and it made both chambers of the Thai legislature fully elected. The first election, under the new constitution, took place in 2001. The anti-military Thai Dak Thai, led by telecommunications entrepreneur Taksin Shinawat, won 248 of the 500 available seats, making Taksin Prime Minister. Now, it's worth remembering Taksin because he's pretty important for the rest of this story. Um, if it helps, it's the same Taksin who owned Manchester City um, from 2007 to 2008. And if you remember, he was called Frank by fans because, yeah, his name's pretty long. Anyway, in the next election, in 2005, Thai Dak won a massive majority. However, following a financial scandal involving Taksin's telecommunications company, Taksin was forced to call another election soon after, so in 2006. Opposition parties boycotted the election, refused to field candidates, and the Constitutional Court declared the result invalid. The military staged a coup, and Taksin fled Thailand. The military junta abrogated the 1997 constitution, replaced it with this interim constitution, which basically just gave the military absolute power, and drafted a new constitution. Under the new constitution, the Senate wasn't elected, the Prime Minister didn't have to be an MP, and amnesty was granted for the military that took part in the 2006 coup. Anyway, there was a referendum on the new constitution, but criticism of the draft constitution was banned, and the junta threatened to just implement its own constitution if this one was rejected, and even said they wouldn't hold an election until it was ratified. So, somewhat unsurprisingly, and not particularly democratically, the new constitution was technically approved by 58% of voters. Anyway, elections were held under this new constitution in 2007, and People's Power, which is Thai Dak Thai's reincarnation, won a plurality. However, in 2008, People's Power was dissolved by the Constitutional Court after a vote-buying scandal. The next general election came in 2011. This time, Taksin's party was called Prayer Thai, and was led by his sister, Yingluk. They won a majority, and formed a single-party government. However, in 2013, after proposing an amnesty bill which would have allowed Taksin back into Thailand, there was predictably uproar from the opposition parties. To try and solve this, Yingluk called a general election in early 2014, but as happened in 2007, opposition parties boycotted the election and the Constitutional Court again declared the election void because voting took place over more than a day. Again, the military staged a coup and put General Plyot Chanocha in charge as Prime Minister. Now, Historically, every military coup has been quickly followed by an election. So the 2006 coup was quickly followed by the 2007 election, and the coup before that, in 1991, was followed by, yep, you guessed it, the 1992 general election. Now, in keeping with this precedent, Pryor promised an election in 2015, but he then pushed it back to mid-2016, and then 2017, and then 2018, then February 2019, and then, apparently because of the royal coronation ceremony, March 2019. So, basically for five years, Thailand was ruled by a completely unelected military junta. Anyway, when the election finally went ahead, it was under the rules of the new 2017 constitution. Under this new constitution, there were four new rules for elections that were worth making note of. Firstly, the house was now split into 350 geographical constituencies with 150 party list constituencies. This meant constituency boundaries had to be redrawn because previously there were 400 geographical constituencies. Now, controversially, the junta twisted the new constitution to exempt the election commission from complying with existing districting laws about how you were supposed to draw constituencies. Unsurprisingly, 
the constituencies were gerrymandered to favour the junta, who were represented by the Palang Plakadat party. Secondly, Thais now got two votes, one for the local MP, as happened before, and one for the party list MPs, and the party list de minimis was also lowered to 70,000 votes, which massively advantaged smaller parties. Because basically what that means is, as a smaller party, as long as you can cobble together 70,000 votes nationally, and this is in a population of 70 million people, you can get a seat. This meant that more parties than ever contested the election, a ridiculous 80 in total, with an average of 35 per constituency. The third rule worth noting is that the Prime Minister now didn't need to be an MP. They just needed to be selected by a majority of MPs and Senate members. Remember, in 1997, the Senate was entirely elected. Under the new constitution, all of its 250 members were chosen by the National Council for Peace and Order, which is what the military junta called their interim government. In practice, this meant that the Prime Minister only needed the support of 126 democratically elected MPs to become Prime Minister, assuming he was supported by the whole Senate as well. Fourthly and finally, any government would be bound by a 20-year national strategy roadmap decided by the NCPO which massively limited their legislative freedom. Anyway, back to the actual election. As in 2011, Taksim was represented by Pu'er Thai, but this time they only ran in 250 of the 350 geographical constituencies. In that remaining 100 that Pu'er Thai wasn't running in, Taksim was represented by a party called Thai Raksa Chart. Controversially, Thai Raksa Chart nominated Princess Ubon Rat as their prime ministerial candidate, who's the older sister of Thailand's current king. Now, to understand this, you need to know that the monarchy is a really big deal in Thailand. For example, Father's Day is celebrated on the previous king's birthday, and uh, the royal anthem is played before films at the cinema. So, by fielding an ex-princess, because she technically renounced her royalty when she married an American in 1972, although she's since divorced, Tyrax the Chart was appealing to this royalist sentiment. In response, King Wajira Longkorn, who's the current king, issued an unprecedented royal proclamation, declaring that his sister's candidacy was just inappropriate. Tyraxa Chart was dissolved shortly afterwards by the Constitutional Court, which cited customary law. Without their support, this meant that Taksin's parties were only competing in 250 of the 350 available seats. In the end, Pu'er Thai won 136 of those 250 seats, making it the largest party. Palang Plakarat came second with 116 total, and in third place was a new anti-military party called Future Forward, who won 81 total. Now, Future Forward, despite doing very well, actually expected even more seats. With the 70,000 day minimis, Future Forward would have won 57 party list seats. However, according to the election commission, the 70,000 figure really meant any party whose votes rounded up to 70,000. So actually, any party with 35,000 votes. This is, let's say, a little suspicious, because this difference in seats prevented Pu'er Thai and Future Forward from forming an anti-junta coalition. Instead, their seven-party coalition only had 245 seats, which is six seats away from the 251 required for a majority. Three months later, anyway, Palang Plakarat formed a ridiculous 19-party coalition which just had a parliamentary majority. So, unsurprisingly, this meant General Prayut stayed as Prime Minister with basically all of the 250 Senate votes in his favour. Now, in early 2020, Future Forward was dissolved by the Constitutional Court on these dubious charges about campaign financing. This triggered mass protests, not just about Future Forward's dissolution, but the military's influence in politics generally, and the military's relationship with the monarchy. Now, this needs a little bit of explaining, because the new king of Thailand, Wajira Longkorn, who came to power in 2016, is, you know, I don't know how to put this politely, he's a bit of a nutcase. Now, before becoming king, he had three wives, which, no comment on your character, it's just quite unusual, and an endless string of scandals, including a hilarious leak video of the most insane dog party you've ever seen. So Thai elites were obviously reluctant to let him become king, so his coronation to power had to be enabled by the military junta. Since then, he's had another divorce, removed statues and plaques commemorating the defeat of the monarchy in 1932, made elderly advisers cruel in front of him, shaved the heads of courtiers who displeased him, made his poodle, which is called Fufu, an air chief marshal, and made one of his mistresses a royal consort. Perhaps more substantially and more worryingly, he's also assumed direct command of two army units, changed the constitution to allow him to rule from afar, because we haven't mentioned this yet, but he lives in a hotel in Germany, and taken personal control of the Crown Property Bureau, which was previously under the Ministry of Finance, and it has holdings of about $40 billion. 
He's allocated himself $1.1 billion for the 2021 fiscal year from the government budget. And he's also talked openly about his longing for the return of absolute monarchy. And obviously, as we mentioned before, he meddled in the election. Criticising the king is dangerous, though, because under Thailand's archaic Les Majeste laws, criticism of the king can incur a sentence of between 3 and 15 years in prison. So the protest bubbled on for a few months, but really came to a head in recent days. On the evening of October the 14th, an estimated 200,000 people marched on Government House. Now, riot police dispersed the protesters, and at 4am, the government declared this severe state of emergency, which banned gatherings of more than four people, and gave the government power to detain protesters without charge for up to 30 days, with no access to lawyers or family, and suppress any information which could, quote, create fear or affect national security. Now, two things worth mentioning here. Firstly, these national security powers are ambiguous enough that they give the government the power to do basically anything. Secondly, this focus on information and media is interesting, it's worth noting. The Thai government have been proactively suppressing the media. They shut down this national TV station called Voice TV for broadcasting the protests. They've banned the Telegram app, which was being used to coordinate the protests. And they've even launched legal proceedings against both Facebook and Twitter for just hosting anti-government material. Anyway, these protests continued, and in response, Prime Minister Prayat ominously warned the protesters, and this is a quote, Do not trifle with the powerful Grim Reaper. Death may come today or another day. Everyone can die at any moment. Anyway, his threats didn't work, and protests just kept going. In response to the continued protest, on Friday the 16th, the police used water cannons on the protesters. Now, very worryingly, according to Human Rights Watch, the water was laced with a tear gas-like chemical and a blue dye for identifying protesters for arrests later. This obviously only escalated tensions, and protests continued. On the evening of Wednesday the 21st, protesters demanded that Pryot resign, giving him three days to do so. In an attempt to de-escalate the protests, on Thursday morning, Pryot rescinded this emergency decree declaring a severe state of emergencies. But now that protesters have made their demands explicit, we might see the protests subside until the three-day deadline on Saturday. Anyway, hope you enjoyed the video. I, I hope the video has helped you at least understand some of the context behind the protests, why they're protesting, and if nothing else has gone some way to illustrating quite how politically precarious Thailand today and Thailand historically is. Obviously, if you enjoyed the video, please do subscribe, and um, if you're really feeling generous, um, support on Patreon is really greatly appreciated. It, it really does help more than you think, and um, like and subscribe and all that shenanigans.